Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Premiere on Script and welcome to Adobe Premiere Pro 2019. This new update to Premiere has been out for about a month now, so you've had enough time to go over all the new features, whether that be, you know, the hue saturation curves or updates to essential graphics or whatever you're into. You've had enough time to go over that. So now it's time to talk about the stuff that gets me really excited. I get really excited about the new features that they've released in the scripting API. And in Premiere 2019, there's quite a bit really awesome stuff. And in today's video, I want to go over my top three favorite new features in the new Premiere scripting API. Now, the reason we have new features in this update is because we've updated to CEP 9.0. So before, if you had your player debug mode set at 8.0, you'll need to update that to 9 if you want to load panels. Uh, that's just a side note, and if you need some more background on how that works, you can come out to uh, the YouTube channel, watch my second video, Loading Custom Script Panels in Adobe Premiere. That'll show you how to get panels loaded in CEP9. But if we're just working in an Extend Script, which we'll be doing today, no need to worry about anything. Open up Premiere 2019, and let's talk about the new features. So my new features that I'm super excited about are adjusting sequence settings, removing duplicates, and creating subsequences, which we can then create nests out of our active sequence. Um, and so this is awesome. If you want to see the full list of new updates, you can go to a couple places to find that. One place would be go to the sample code, which there'll be links below to all of these, and there'll be links in the blog post to all of these. Uh, the sample code, you can see how this new code is used when they put it into action. You can also go out to the root of this repository of the ppro panel, and you'll see the Premiere Pro 13.0 API improvements. And if you're just trying to kind of monitor things and see when new features come out in the scripting API, you can also just kind of monitor the Premiere Pro SDK forums. And Bruce here posted a link to this Medium article, which goes over, again, all of the new features um, that have been released in Premiere Pro version 13. So uh, without further ado, let's jump in and start getting into the code, the stuff that really matters to you. And I'll try and do a brief overview of all of these, and you can dig deeper by yourself once you see what you like. So for my first new feature that I love, it is adjusting sequence settings. So before, uh, and in previous videos, I've talked about creating sequences. I think the first thing I went over in one of my earlier videos was how to use create new sequence to prompt the user to create a sequence in here. Uh, in there, you get to name your sequence, and then you choose your preset, loads up, and there you go. You have a new sequence created over here. But that's not really good for automating like a lot of processes because you have constant user input uh, that's going to keep prompting them on what they want to make. So the way to fix that was to come in and create a sequence from a preset. Now with this, you have to go in and save a .sq preset and then route your code uh, to the local path of that file. But I mean, it was much easier when you're trying to make a lot of sequences happen, which is what we're trying to do a lot of the time in automating setting up a project or something like that. So if you run that, you can see it just quickly creates the sequence that are up to the specs that I'm looking for. I'll delete that. And then the last way uh, you could create a sequence is just by having a sequence already in here. And maybe that means that you create one sequence from a preset and then you come in and you clone that. So here I know that sequence is zero is gonna be the sequence I have open right here with some footage in it. And if I wanted to clone that, I just go app.project.sequence is zero clone, because that's the only sequence in the project. So I know it's gonna be zero there. And that's gonna do just that. It's just gonna create sequence one uh, with copy at the end of it. And it'll look exactly the same. So there's your crash course in creating sequences. Now let me show you what is so cool that we get in this new version. In the new version, we can actually go in and get the settings of that sequence. And then we can turn around and set those settings. So if I write line out here to the console, we'll clear the console, and we'll go to this very first sequence and run the, the method uh, get settings. And what that's going to do it's going to spit out this object sequence settings over here. 
Um, so not really, you know, a bunch of use to us in that format. But if we come down, and I'm just going to use a few examples here, uh, we will save that as a variable current settings, and then we'll write out to the console a bunch of these uh, settings, things like current settings dot video frame rate dot seconds, current settings dot video frame height, current settings dot video frame width, current settings dot audio sample rate dot seconds. And don't worry about the stuff that's going on over here. Let's just run that and we'll see. Now we can dig into that. We can see that the old setting frame rate is 0.0336667 or 29.97 with a bunch of trailing numbers. Frame height 1080, frame width 1920, audio sample rate, uh, another long decimal that comes out to 96 kilohertz, I think, or yeah, 96,000 hertz. So there we go, we just access all this information. And there's all this stuff that you can access, there's like so much. If you come into Property Explorer, which I also recommend in an earlier video, I'll link to the actual uh, link to the Adobe Exchange down below in this video. But Property Explorer is really great. We can come in here, open this up, paste in that code, app.project sequences zero, get settings, run it, and we can actually see all of those settings that we have access to. So you saw me list off a couple, but we also have things like pixel aspect ratio, video field type, preview codec, preview frame width, preview frame height, bit depth, all of this really cool stuff, even down into some VR projection and VR layout information. Now you have to go in and test all these out, and I have to admit I haven't tested all these out just yet, but what I really love is I love being able to work with video frame height, video frame width, and video frame rate, which is what I'm going to show you how to change up right now. So let's go in here and actually change the settings of the sequence to something a little less desirable. So let's go to like um, something really weird, 450 by 1400. We will change the sample rate. That's at 96. That's not what I would want to work with, so we'll change that, and we'll change the uh, frames per second to like 15 or something like that. Get really weird. Yeah, it looks all real weird. So now if we run this again, we'll get all that information. We'll clear the console, run it out, and we'll see that it is now at you know 15 frames per second. Uh, the frame width and the frame height are set like that, but I want to return it to stuff that I'm comfortable, mainly things like 29.97 frame rate, 1080 by 920, and... 48,000 hertz uh, for the audio sample rate. And what I can do with that is, as we looked at the code before, we stored all of those settings in this current settings variable. And so now I'm gonna come down to current settings and just like I called that information when I was writing out to the console here, I'm just gonna set it equal to different values. So for video frame rate, we saw that it came out originally as um, 0 0.0666667. So that is like how long one frame lasts within a total second. So what we can do is just set that to 1 divided by 29.97, and it'll set it to um, that length we need to be the frame rate of 29.97. Now, the video frame height, video frame width, I'm sure you can figure that out. Just plug those numbers in. And we're gonna do something very similar for the audio sample rate as we did for the audio frame rate. Out of one second divided by 48,000, that will give us this decimal number that we need to pass in in order to make this work. Now what we'll do is we'll go app.project sequences zero and we'll set the settings to this current settings variable, which now has all this information changed. And we will then uncomment all this stuff. That way we can write up the new stuff and I'm gonna change this. And I will uh, provide all of this code in my blog post. If you go over to the website, premieronscript.com, find the blog post, you can download this uh, script file right here. So you can walk through all this stuff, copy and paste it, do whatever you want with it, use it in your scripts. Um, so yeah, let's see if this works. So we're gonna come in here we see that this is all funky and vertical and weird. And we will run this after we clear the console. And now we can see just from the console, the frame rate, 15 frames a second, 960, all this stuff. And then we changed it to 29.97, or at least pretty close to it. 
1080 by 1920, and it looks like the audio sample rate didn't change for some reason. And I know why the audio sample rate changed, did not change. If you come down to current settings, audio sample rate, I did dot seconds where we can see up here, um, that's not what I wrote in there. So if we remove this and then rerun it, uh, we should get it out and you can see now it comes out to 48,000 hertz. And if we come into Premiere, make sure that this all worked out for us, we can see that our sequence is back to the settings we originally wanted it to be at. We can come in and verify that up here. We got 29.97, 1920 by 1080, 48,000 hertz. So there you go. That is my very first favorite new feature about this new thing. The ability to do this gives us a lot more access to creating things really quickly and on the fly and allows us to automate going into the uh, sequence settings dialog box here, which who needs to be in here? You know, that's just a pain in the butt. So we move past that. The next feature that I'm super excited about is a feature for removing duplicates. Now we had a pretty thick, uh, big feature up here. It took a little while to explain that. This one's super simple. If you've ever been mastering a project, maybe you have to do a handoff or you want to archive a project or something like that. Uh, and you come up to this new feature down here, remove unused is great, but there's also consolidate duplicates. Uh, meaning that if you like bring stuff in and it sees two video files that are the same thing, uh, it'll consolidate those. Really simple, um, but I know that the way I round out my projects and get them ready for handoffs is I have these scripts that do that. So this is a great thing to just include, and if you if you have a script that does that or are planning to make one, include this in there. That way you don't have any of these duplicate clips. So to show you an example of this, right now I have all this GoPro footage in here. We can go down and see that of all the GoPro footage, it is 35 clips, but you can see there's duplicates in here. I have GoPro ending in 162 uh, twice right there, ending in 163 twice. So if I just come down, we'll run this script, app.project.consolidateduplicates. Super simple, remember that number, we have um, 37 total items in the project. We run it, pop back in, and we now have 27 items. So it found 10 items that were duplicated media, and it removed those. Super simple. And, you know, sometimes the best features are the, the most simple ones. So I really, really enjoy that one. Now, the last thing that I'm super excited for is this feature of creating subsequences, meaning going into a sequence and either based off of track targeting or in and out points or both, we can almost nest a sequence, but we're not nesting because it's not actually happening in the active sequence timeline. It'll just pop it up here. This ultimately gives us more flexibility in the timeline. And if we do want to nest something in it, it gives us that ability as well. And I'll go into that at the very, very end. So let's start off with this and let's start with uh, track targeting because I know I haven't covered that in other videos, I don't believe. And it may be a new feature or it may have come out halfway through Premiere version 12. Um, but this is basically how you would target tracks. Um, we'll target the active sequence dot video tracks, save that in a variable, and then do a for loop through all the tracks because we have three tracks here. And what this little loop right here is going to do is it's just going to ask, uh, is this track targeted using the is targeted function? And if is targeted is equal to true, it's going to use the set targeted function to set them to not targeted. And if it is not targeted, it's going to set it to true. So basically just a toggle. So if we look in here right now, track one is targeted just in video tracks. And if we run this, it should swap that. And of course it didn't. Let's see if we can, if it works this time. Well, that's not working as I expected to. I'm gonna remove this from the script that I'm gonna be giving out to you guys because there might be a bug in that area. Um, and we're just gonna move on to what is so cool about the new feature. So there's a couple ways that we can create these subsequences. Now, the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna go app.project.activesequence.create subsequence. And then there's this 
uh, it takes a Boolean, a true or false. Now, what this Boolean is asking is it's asking if we want to ignore track targeting. Uh, and you can see more details about this in the sample code. It's kind of a weird way of wording it. If you just come into the sample code and search, um, search for sub sequence. You can see the the how they describe it here. Create subsequence uses track targeting to select clips where there is no current clip selection. Read through that. Uh, but basically, all you need to know about this is that it's asking you if you want to ignore track selection. And this first thing where we're trying to create a sub selection via track targeting, we want it to take into account track selection and track targeting. So we're going to put a false on there. So by putting false, we're saying we want it to honor track targeting. And what happens when we do this is then I'm going to store that in a variable and then change the name to subseek by track target. And we'll see what happens over here. We will see that right now only the first track is targeted right here. And if we come over and run this, we should have a new sequence titled subseek by track target. And if we come in, we'll see that it only brought over the clips that were in there on the first track. And of course, everything in the audio tracks because all of those were targeted. Now, if we come back out to sequence one, and I'm gonna delete this for now, um, and we go down, how, how would we do this when we wanted to deal with in and out points? So what we would do is we would go in app.project.activeSequence, we'll set the in point to 30 seconds, the out point to 45 seconds, and then we will run uh, the same code as above, but we will include true here, meaning we want it to ignore track targeting. It doesn't matter what tracks are targeted here. It's just going to chop this up by endpoint and out point and then move that into a new sequence that we're going to call subseek by in and out. So if we run that, it's going to create two sequences for us now. The first one, so one we saw before, takes everything on the targeted tracks. The second one is just going to be this little nest that takes everything that was between the in and out points right here. Now, if you wanted to use both track targeting and in and out points, you would use that same code um, as above, but you would just set this to false, meaning you want it to use track targeting. And we'll go in, we'll delete these two, we'll run this code one more time, and we'll see all three types, which is going to be uh, subsequence by track target, subsequence by in and out, and subsequence by both. And we can see this one, I didn't clear the in and out points from the previous time we ran this, so there was an in and out point set there. So that's why we come into this and it looks different than before. But the really cool thing I want to show you about what this does and enables us to do is that I think it's really cool that we can now nest clips and put them back into our active sequence. So in order to do that, I'm going to uncomment this code down here where I'm going to create a new subsequence. I'm going to set this to true, and I'm going to call this nest seek. Uh, then we'll name it nest seek, and we'll write out the endpoint, which because we're up here, we're setting the endpoint to 30. That should be uh, just fine. And what I want to do here is then, now that I have nest seek stored here, I'm going to go app.project active sequence video track zero overwrite clip, and I'm going to overwrite it with nest seek.project item and put it in at the time 30. So we're gonna go and make sure we're all clear in here and run all of these now, and we'll see what happens to the original sequence. Now when we come out, we can see right here on the first track, we actually placed that sequence that we have up here called nest seek back into our original sequence, effectively nesting the clips that were there. So those are my top three new features that have been unlocked in the scripting API in Premiere 2019. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it wasn't too long. If you want to see the other features, just jump in there and like it says right here, start coding. And thank you again for watching these videos. I can't wait to put out some more in the future.